there's additional kind of attributes related to edges, obviously, right? There's not just, you know, hard edges and soft edges or interior edges and outside edges, but it keeps me kind of organized because there's different kinds of levels of ways of looking at edges. So the first one is whether it's a, an outside edge or an inside edge. So whether it's out here along this, this these borders between objects or whether it's on the inside of this object. And uh, the next one is the quality of how that edge turns. So usually with edges, things can either be very sharp, like this sharp edge right here, or they can be round, like here. So does that surface round off, or does it end abruptly and then change to another? Because that's you know, the difference between like a sphere, I think just got dramatic next door. <laughs> bum, bum. Should punctuate all my sentences for me. You know, it's going to a sphere is going to have a very different kind of edge than a cube, right? So a cube, when it's coming or when light's coming around this object, it's going to end very abruptly. And so that tells you a lot about the quality of that surface, whether that's the outside edge of that surface or the inside edge. Um, it's, going to, it's going to have a different kind of sense to it. So in order to get this to feel really rounded, and there's a certain kind of softening that's going to happen on the edge of a sphere because that surface keeps going and going around and away from your eye. Incidentally, uh, in uh, perspective, if you're looking at a cylinder or a sphere, can you see halfway around the object? If you're looking at a cylinder, do you actually see halfway around it? Ever thought about that before? These are the things that keep me up at night, <laughs> by the way. The answer is no, you do not see halfway around the object. So the outside edge of an ellipse is closer to you than the center of a circle. Fun fact. So you can see these have very different qualities in their turning. So this has a very abrupt edge, and uh, the other one has a very, very soft edge. And so that's one way of kind of paying attention to what's going on with an object is how those edges actually turn in space. Um, so that's, that's the first level. So I, mean, I should probably write these up here just so I can keep track of myself. So first level is, is exterior or contour. Reverse interior. That's probably too many marks there. There we go. Interior. Then the second level is this right here, is the quality of turning. The third one is texture. So the texture is going to have a specific quality along the contour. It's going to affect how that silhouette looks. So it's going to be on the contours Stop changing the size of my brush here. There we go. Very good sight. Silhouette. So it's going to have a specific kind of contour that's going to be affecting its silhouette. You know, so if it's fuzzy, it's going to have you know hairs coming off the side. Or if it's going to be smooth, it's going to be different. And the same on the inside, you're going to see texture on the interior forms. So where does texture happen the most on the interior of forms? If you're looking at the parts of the light, where does texture happen the most? One, two, three, four, five. Does it happen in the highlight, the halftone, terminator, form shadow, or cast shadow? What do we think? So it happens, it's a, it's a little bit of a trick question. It happens along the halftone and the terminator. 
So in the between the halftone and the terminator is where texture is usually going to be the strongest on the surface. Because really what texture is, texture is actually just smaller forms on top of a larger form. So that's all texture really is. Uh, it's just smaller little forms that are happening along the surface of something. And then uh, the fourth one that you can run into in terms of edge quality or um, dealing with your, those edges is its material substance. And that usually has to do with whether it is running into my toolbar. Uh, whether something is transparent translucent or opaque so something that's like a jelly bean is going to be a lot different than a metal ball right so there's there's going to be evidence of it's going to affect that subsurface scattering. Um, it's going to affect how you're seeing through the object, which is part of that subsurface scattering. But all that's going to make a big difference in terms of how that edge qualities work. So these four attributes, whether this is an exterior or interior, the quality of that turning, whether it's going to be a sharp turning or a softer turning, what kind of texture is then along that kind of turning, and then it, as well as its material substance, it's also going to make a big difference in terms of describing how a form happens. So if I take this little thing that I've, I've sketched over here, this little mushroom, and I start painting in its general colors, start to get those little beep things on the garbage cans. Right, beep, beep, beep. So I can go ahead and paint in you know, its, its average color, then I can start thinking about its quality. So the edge here along its base is going to be uh, a little bit sharper because of the contour of the turning along the outside edge of its, I don't know what they call that, a frill or something? I don't, I'm not down with my rusher room terminology. Just not that cool. Get someone in the biology department over here. But you know, just as before, you know, when we're painting these things in, it can be a good idea just to like paint in your average colors around things. So even just using a really basic uh, round brush like this, and you just get your normal colors in here, and then I can start differentiating out some of these value relationships inside of this edge, inside of this object. I'm not spending a lot of time, you know, painting it into specifically. I just want to get in those colors and values just like we've had before. Because once I get these in here, then I can start dealing with some of the issues regarding edges. So let's get this in here real quick. Too light. So uh, when dealing with these forms, I, I'm looking over my object. So I'm going to have one kind of turning on this stalk that's going to wrap around. I'm going to have one kind of turning along this contour over here. It's going to have a, it's rounded, but it's much sharper. It's a much narrower rounding than what's happening on the stalk. There's also a contour here that kind of goes, that undulates along the surface of this mushroom. So it kind of rotates here, it comes up here rotates back over here and comes up over here before going out again. So I know it's got this kind of contour along the surface overall. And so I need to be able to indicate that as I paint. And so that's going to affect how these values shift, even though like the, if you look at my actual photograph, the lighting is relatively flat because it was a cloudy day. But I know there's going to be little pits in here as it follows this contour 
on this surface around, and then it's going to follow this contour up here around. So kind of learning to be able to look at everything in this relatively uh, three-dimensional way and actually think about things as having dimension will help you actually paint it with more dimension rather than just trying to replicate something in your photograph. Like if you had a photograph of Spider-Man out and you were just painting over it. Because it'll actually look much flatter than if you actually sat down and thought about how these forms actually work. So I got my general parts of the light in here and uh, close off some of this. Now what I can do is we have some different brushes in here we can use to help us kind of manipulate some of these turnings. So let's get rid of that extra layer on top. And these are uh, what we call these mixer brushes. So you'll notice if you've kind of played around with the brush set I gave you, I've got like this texture set, I've got this most used set, and I've just used a bland you know, circle brush on this whole thing. I haven't used any fancy textures yet. Uh, I've got these little texture brushes I made right here, and then I've got these blends right here. And they all do a little bit different things. So this one kind of has a broader scatter blend, like so. Um, this one has the, the most broad one. But it's just taking that brown and it's pushing it out. And then this one's more of a uh, kind of direct blend brush. So it pulls the color out and then knocks it back. And so I can take these along these interior edges and start blending these colors together so that it softens up their effect. You have to be careful with these kinds of blends because you can treat them in a way that will um, kind of make your whole painting look really mushy, which you don't want. And the mushiness, what that often is a result of in a painting, is using the same edge everywhere or in the wrong places. So for example, in this one I want, make I want to make sure the interior of this is pretty soft. So I'm going to blend these edges in here so it's relatively soft in its treatment. But if I were then to come down here and I was, give I was giving the same edge treatment to the base of this mushroom, it would just start looking really blendy, right? That doesn't look great. So I don't like that at all because it's not giving me an edge that describes the surface of that object. Um, so what I would come in here, if I wanted to blend this in, I might blend in softly up here just so we get rid of that gray, but I'd want to make sure that there's a distinct continuation of this edge as it comes forward, and so I would go back to my regular brush up here, and you have to make sure when you're in the mixer brushes it just stays on them so I have to come back and make sure I switch back to my regular brush before I come in over here. Um, so I can come in and clean up this edge so it's just a little bit sharper. So I can still have some of that softness at the base but it's not the same quality of softness that I have on the interior of this form. Knock that back so it stays back. Stay back. I don't necessarily want to have like a bunch of choppy work up here either. So that's where you know you come in and you can work these edges uh, back and forth a bit. So I can push this in like so working across the form and then work back along it so to really soften it up. Anyway, the manipulation of edges kind of in the way I was describing with all those, those four different features, you know, interior, exterior, uh, whether it, it, you know, the quality of that turning, whether it's soft and round or whether it's abrupt and texture and then subsurface scattering issues, that's what we call edge quality. So maybe people have talked to you in some of your other classes about, you know, drawing classes or something, they say, you know, you need to have better edge quality. That's usually what they're talking about, is that there's some particular uh, edge that's not being fully descriptive of what's possible. There is a fifth level of edges, and that's where you know, you're dealing with expression. 
well, you, you know, different kinds of brush strokes or ways of painting um, to consider. But kind of breaking it down into those different categories just helps me focus on uh, what I want to get out of this object. So a place where we would want maybe a super soft edge is on a rounded surface that's fading away from me. So what I probably want like a fairly soft edge is on this back contour over here. So I wanted to have that sense that it's rounded and moving away from me. So I can take my blender and really work that edge. Uh, one of the most common kind of little techniques for working an edge is this one right here. So I'll set up a couple of little colors right here. So let's do a bright purple. And we'll drop that into here. And then we'll do another one next to it. And we'll make that gaudy green. I think that's a Ben and Jerry's flavor, right? So we got these two really bright colors, and one of the kind of the simplest ways of dealing with edges, and I got this for early on from one of my teachers named Don Siegmiller, but basically you take your edge and you work across it back and forth. So you get nice little extensions of colors back and forth between the two first, and then you work up and down that edge to get that smoother transition. And then you can just kind of do it again and again until you've got it where you want it. And that's a really, really common way of working with edges. Uh, you, quite, you can, of course, just straight up paint them. So if I were to come over here and uh, add this color back in, uh, I can work this edge a similar way just by painting it. So I can take my color here and make sure my mixer brush is off. I'm using the paint, right? There we go. And as you just kind of work into it, you know, the so having some transparency on your brush you can work back and forth, and then you select the colors that are happening on the inside. You know, until you've got a nice edge that you want. It's weird how it's darkening it though. I think it has to do with a, a transfer effect that's on the brush. So you can get different qualities of edges. You know, if you wanted something that was more textured, you grab your texture brush and have that work softly across that surface. So there's lots of there's there's a couple different ways of kind of playing around your edges. So that's what those mixer brushes are for. Is kind of going in there and really uh, tweaking quality of that edge. Well, I like to use like these uh, kind of super mixy ones on the inside of forms a lot like this to really soften it back. I just want to always be wary that I'm not leaving things looking smushy, but instead making them feel more solid as a result of whatever I'm doing based off of the nature of that object. So again, you're just using these mixer brushes to soften up that edge on the back end. <clears throat> but you can see how the back end now feels like it's further away and the closer end feels closer just because of those edge qualities. Uh, and that even goes back to you know our discussions about contrast, motion, and noise, where you know something that has a higher contrast is going to come closer to you than something that has a lower contrast. So by reducing the contrast in the edge of the back part, it feels like it's further away than something that's up close. There we go, brush.
Another thing that I like to factor in when I'm painting is I like to feel out the contour of the surface. So, you know, if it's going, if it's rounding out, I'm going to paint it following that contour or feeling like I'm following, imagining, you know, my brain as if I was taking my stylus and I was petting the mushroom, as it were, uh, in the background and, you know, feeling out how that quality turns. It's actually something I like to reference in like a figure drawing class, classes that I've taught. Because students will use really, really dark marks when they first start drawing, especially the figure for some reason. Like they'll, they're breaking their pastels on their newsprint. And I go up and I'm like, well, you know, if you were drawing with that pastel or charcoal on the model, what effect would it have on them? Right, they'd be bleeding and they'd probably punch you in the face and run out of the room and everyone would be upset and get kicked out of school. It'd be awful. So I tell them, you have to imagine as if you were drawing with your pencil or tool on a puppy's belly. So if you were drawing on a puppy's belly, just how soft and careful would you draw, right? As long as you're like a well-adjusted human being, right? doesn't have malicious feelings towards puppies. But, um, well, that's how you generally want to treat your work, because it's very easy for us to draw really loudly, you know, to draw really harsh and dark. Um, but you want to get that full range. And what's nice about having these tools where we have pressure sensitivity, you can draw really dark, and then you can also pull back and draw really light. And getting in, being able to manipulate that full range of your brushes is something that you want to master if you plan on doing any kind of digital illustration or really any kind of work. You want to be able to have that full range of expressive power. You know, if you think about usually the music you like, there's usually a certain range within that music. It's not all the same tone the whole time, right? There's some things that are louder or uh, there's more texture or grungier or softer overall. And uh, that's something to keep in mind as you paint. Because you can you know, equally manipulate that visually as well as other people can do in other kinds of work. There's a good T-section spot underneath that mushroom. Have I mentioned T-sections in here? I don't think it would come up with an illustrator assignment, right? Uh, T-sections are actually a really important way of thinking about edges, uh, especially contours. So just literally T... Let's see, where is I? Got to switch back to my brush. There we go. T-sections. Everybody remembers their typography class, right? They've not forgotten all of their favorite fonts, like papyrus. So if we have the letter T here, right, what do we call this bottom part of the T coming down? You don't know. F for you. What about this part? It's not arm. Hmm? Cross So whenever you're drawing anything, usually, especially if there's any space in it, there's going to be T-sections. So if you look right here, let's put up a new layer on top of this. Get out obnoxious purple. Get more obnoxious, put some more pink in it. If you look at this, this mushroom, this part right here is a T, right? There's a little T right here. And you know, if there was something coming out from behind them, you could imagine there being a T right there. And look, it's like this is uh, what's that guy from the the Burger Shack thing in SpongeBob? The boss with the the crab. <laughs> but uh, anyway, wherever there's a T section like this, where something is intersecting with another object, the bar on the T usually has more contrast and you soften the leg, especially as it passes underneath something. And that helps kind of pull it forward. So you can soften the top of the, the leg. 
and then sharpen up the the top of the T. I want the that. So when I when I do these, I'll consciously soften down or reduce the contrast of things as they pass underneath things. So whether that's you know mixing it more with the background or coming in here with one of these uh, blendy brushes. Um, it helps push it back by softening it. So even though it may sharpen up again as it comes away from that object, you know, gradually or abruptly, depending on what it is, um, I'll make sure that where it's crossing over, um, like right here, it's going to be sharper in that foreground. Let's go back to the brush tool. And so that's a general principle that I like to follow when I'm working, whether that's a, a big complicated picture or something relatively simple. Uh, it just helps me think about the processes that I'm actually using so that I can get results that I like. So that's edges. So there's the five kind of big things over here. So it's whether it's an exterior or an interior edge, whether it's uh, what its quality of turning is, whether it's a sharp turn or a soft turn, the texture that's on the surface, its material substance. Uh, so if it's transparent, translucent, or opaque. So if it's translucent or transparent, it may have a lot of subsurface scattering that I need to think about. Uh, if it's opaque, I probably don't need to worry about it. And, uh, and then, of course, there's, uh, I mentioned there's a sixth one, which is the expressive quality. So that's you know, how you're handling your brushwork to make it more expressive. So, edges. Any questions, comments? Concerns? Am I going to get written up about edges? So I'm going to come around and check on everybody's program.